Sudan's short-lived truce is on the brink as the warring forces level allegations at each other. What next, we ask in our latest weekly update on the issue. The World Health Assembly voted on Palestine and the divide was clear as countries from the global north were among the few who downplayed the situation. What is the health crisis in Palestine? And finally, there is a new twist in the struggle of New Caledonia for independence from France. I'm your host Shriya and we'll be looking at these stories in Daily Debrief. The Sudanese army has suspended its participation in ongoing ceasefire talks in Jeddah, where the two rivals, the Sudanese army and par paramilitary rapid support forces, have been engaged for nearly a month. The army and the RSF had agreed to extend a week-long ceasefire deal by five days just before it was due to expire late on May 29th. With another ceasefire failing to hold, truce in Sudan is only a dream so far for its people. Ever since the fighting began in April, it has pushed at least 1.4 million people out of their homes, leading to mass displacement and migration into neighbouring countries, while millions in Sudan wait for aid and protection. We ask Prashant the latest in our weekly update on the continuing conflict in Sudan. Thank you for joining us, Prashant. So, the Sudanese army has suspended its role in these ceasefire talks. And as much as there was fear of another ceasefire not holding, can you tell us what is the latest right now of the situation? Right. So, uh, this is of course our <coughs> weekly Sudan update, which we seem to be coming back every week because the conflict is taking its own twists and turns. And uh, what we're seeing right now, like you said, uh, is that the Sudanese army, the latest news is that as of recording is, is that it has announced it will not participate in the ceasefire talks. Now, uh, the key issue here, of course, is that they're claiming that the rapid support forces are violating uh, the ceasefire terms. Uh, interestingly, uh, if you look on the 28th of uh, May, there was a report published by uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States who were the joint mediators of this truce. And just for some context, the truce came into being on 22nd May. And it was for one week, it was extended on 29th for five more days. And the report actually said that both the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces had violated quite a few of the, uh, you know, uh, provisions of the truce. So, while there was a reduction during the first seven days at least, reports say that after that fighting has intensified a bit and now because of this announcement, it's more in uh, crisis. But the fact remains that, uh, you know, there is really the question of uh, the, the reports basically say that it's not been fulfilled, the truce was never fulfilled to its full potential. And what was this potential we are talking about? One of the key aspects of the truce, for instance, was that there would be humanitarian aid delivered to those who were affected by the fighting and the impact has been really, really bad. Uh, so, but uh, apparently what the sources on the ground tell us is that no real corridor has been set up. In fact, people who were worst affected by the fighting, like people in Khartoum, they are not received much aid. Similarly, and Sudanese armed forces, which has air superiority, they have their air force under their control. They had guaranteed that, they would, that there would be no uh, use of air force, but apparently there was at least one recorded attack and also sorties by the air forces were quite common. The rapid support forces had promised that it would not occupy civilian buildings, but it continued to do so. And an example of that was the office of the Sudanese Communist Party, which was also occupied. And today the army is, and that is on Tuesday, the army is, or Wednesday, the army has claimed that this occupation is the reason they are not participating in the ceasefire talks. So all in all, we are seeing the truth suddenly, you know, looking a bit uh, really unsteady. Uh, but which is not surprising because um, I think this was predicted early on. The fact that the truce brought even some limit, some limited amount of reduction of fighting itself is a big thing. But the fact that the grounds for this was always shaky because the fact that both sides were clearly not uh, really interested in following uh, the provisions of the truce. And uh, for instance, if you look at the fact that uh, all the provisions which talked, the key provisions, all of them seem to have been violated to various extents. Humanitarian aid was reportedly stolen uh, from some, at least some consignments were stolen again by both parties as well. So it's likely that both parties saw this truce or these few days as a way to sort of consolidate, regroup, you know, uh, restructure their forces or whatever, rather than it's as any genuine uh, move towards a peace or a settlement of any sort. And I think during this time, and in the past one month, we've seen actually the situation really worsen. I believe 1.4 million people have been displaced, a lot of them internally displaced, but also tens of thousands of people are forced to leave uh, Sudan and go into neighboring countries as well. And we need to remember that it's not that the neighboring countries are very rich or well off. Many of them are extremely poor. Chad, for instance, and all of them are also suffering, you know, extremely due to this crisis as well. The, the death count has crossed about 
850, I think over 3,600 people have been injured. There have been some, some shocking stories of children dying in orphanages because they not got the medical attention that they required during this fighting. So overall, and you know, reports of uh, say food inflation, you know, water costs much more. All of these even basic, most basic human necessities of life are becoming extremely difficult to access because of the fighting. And in this context of the fact that despite this vast and widespread human suffering, these two forces are continuously fighting each other, the army and the, the armed forces and the paramilitary, really shows that, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, there is uh, the, the extent, it's, it's the extent of, and this is essentially a power tussle, the power struggle over who, who controls the future of Sudan, right? And this really shows the extent to which the situation is deteriorated there uh, and how nobody really has been able to sort of has a handle on what's happening in the country. Right, and we've talked about this earlier in this episode, in this show, uh, but it's important to talk about it again. What are some of the obstacles that are... Uh, in the path of achieving truce in Sudan? So I think there are two or three points we need to register. First is that, uh, like I said, the uh, warring parties, the Sunni's armed forces and the uh, rapid support forces, these two forces are, are not just military forces. They are social and economic forces, both controlling substantial chunks of the economy, uh, you know, and both have, both wanting to, uh, to uh, totally control the fate of Sudan, so to speak. So in this context, there is actually very little incentive for them at this point now that they reach this uh, moment to sort of apply uh, to stay, take a step back and then agree with each other because uh, you know they have uh, the, what they see before them is a possibility of complete control over Sudan or at least uh, destroying their opponent to the extent possible that they achieve uh, supremacy. So both of them are very very well entrenched. Both of them have powerful international backers, and this is something we need. This probably brings us to the second point, which is that uh, both of these have. Uh, whether it be countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, or for that matter, countries like the United States and uh, European countries, all of whom have a stake in this issue, but have operated through regional countries. Uh, all of these uh, these two important forces have been have had backing for a very long time. And all these years, we know that they staged a coup in 2021 together. At that time, they were together. In 2021, they staged a coup. Uh, at that time, there was you know, uh, the civilian protesters on the street had time and again made the case that these generals could not be trusted, that these forces were a menace to society, that they had to be curbed. But uh, the international community pretty much uh, enga kept engaging them and urged them to sort of just be part of, uh, the, and allowed them or, you know, permitted them, so to speak, whatever you call them, you know, they were happy to engage with them and allow them to be in control in Sudan. So whether there was a civilian government in Sudan from 2019 or a military government, these generals remained in power and essentially controlled uh, the, all the levels of power. So the, the, the point, I think the key point is that for peace in Sudan, there is no meaningful way as long as this kind of a military uh, regime is on top. And I think that is a point that the protesters on the ground have been making for years now. Uh, the Sudanese Communist Party, the leftist forces, the neighborhood resistance committees, these forces have been making this argument very clearly for years that there is no real hope of peace as long as these generals wield such influence and are able to establish uh, commercial and you know economic links with these forces. So I think that's a larger issue that we need to sort of look at and that will probably determine the future of Sudan as well. Thank you for joining us, Prashant. We'll soon be back with you for another update on Sudan. Thank you for joining. At the 76th World Health Assembly that concluded this week in Geneva, on May 30th, the Assembly adopted a decision recognizing the dire situation created by Israeli occupation in Palestine. With 76 votes in favor and 13 votes against, members of the WHO approved a report on the health conditions in Palestine. The countries that voted in favor include Cuba, Brazil, Bolivia and Zimbabwe, while opposition was mostly represented by countries of the Global North. WHO members also approved a decision that gives grounds to the UN agency to continue monitoring the health situation in Palestine, which could further deteriorate given cutbacks in the World Food Programme and new displacements driven by the Israeli occupation. We are joined by Anna from People's Health Dispatch who has more details on this issue. Hi Anna, thanks for joining us. Uh, first off, can you tell us a little bit about uh, this decision that was adopted at the WHA and why is it important to have a discussion on Palestine at this platform? Uh, yes, so of course, uh, the, the topic of health in, uh, in Palestine is something that's taken up uh, essentially every World Health Assembly. So each year, the Director General of the World Health Organization compiles the report 
uh, on how health in Palestine is being affected by the Israeli occupation. It's an important topic because it essentially shows that uh, the level of an international organization at uh, the level of a UN uh, agency, you know, of uh, how many aspects uh, of Palestinian lives are being affected by, uh, by, the, by the occupation. And something that the report illustrates over and over again is that uh, the, the, the Israeli occupation leads to a lack uh, of essential uh, essential facilities, of essential services like potable health water, uh, potable water, and uh, food, but also uh, on how it impacts on the health system in general. So it's uh, it's quite a comprehensive report, and uh, it's usually accompanied by. A decision taken by the World Health Assembly uh, that's essentially an invitation to the Director General to continue with this effort of monitoring health in Palestine, but also to support uh, the health workers uh, and the health institutions in Palestine uh, to function in spite of the occupation. So, you know, it, it's not something that, that comes as a surprise, but of course, Israel is very vocal. Uh, in, when it comes to this discussion, they oppose it uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, they oppose it uh, usually uh, when uh, when the topic comes up during the discussion at the World Health Assembly. And in their opposition, they have uh, they have quite a bit of allies, uh, especially from the global north. So, you know, we, uh, we know that uh, the United States is uh, someone who usually votes. Essentially, they always vote uh, against the, having this uh, this discussion uh, on the agenda of uh, of the WHA. Uh, in addition to the US, we, you know, we also see the United Kingdom, Australia, and uh, and, and member states of the WHO similar to these uh, who also support Israel's opposition to uh, to the discussion. But what we also witness over and over again uh, is this solidarity from the global south from uh, countries from both uh, West Asia uh, and uh, North Africa, but also from Latin America, uh, who, uh, who stand up in support of the Palestinians and of the Palestinian struggle. So, uh, you know, while uh, the, the vote, uh, essentially what happens during the discussion is that this report, because of the insistence of Israel and of the US, it's put to a vote. The vote is usually, uh, it's uh, it doesn't change much in terms of numbers. It's always uh, 70 plus states voting in favor of the report and of the decision to continue monitoring, and some less than 20 states voting against it. But what we have seen this year uh, is quite interesting because uh, some of the countries in Latin America that have changed their government recently, uh, more specifically Brazil and Colombia, uh, they have changed. Uh, their vote in comparison to last year. So Brazil and Colombia used to vote, vote uh, in line with the US line. Uh, now Brazil has voted in favor of the report, in favor of the decision. Colombia uh, voted for an abstention. So we have seen, you, you know, these kind of shifts actually reflect on how, how the discussion at the WHO is going. And one final point to, to point out here is that, you know, uh, the grounds on which the discussion is being opposed by the US and Israel uh, is uh, under the pretense that it's a too political topic to be tackled by, um, by a technical agency as the WHO. And I think this is very interesting because, you know, it's, uh, uh, it really shows how uh, powerful members of the WHO and of the UN are ready to manipulate with terms uh, so that the discussion takes the, the path that they want. So, of course, we know that, you know, health is very political. Uh, it's affected by, by a number of political factors. Uh, conflict and uh, violence and occupation are definitely factors that impact health and are definitely something that the WHO has to have a say in. Uh, but of course, you know, we see that uh, member states uh, are ready to disregard this when it suits them and then insist on having very similar discussions when it, uh, uh, when it cons yeah. concerns others. Right. And what, are, what have been some other discussions like in the sessions that took place uh, in the past week? Uh, yes, so uh, the World Health Assembly took place over, uh, actually concluded yesterday on May 30th. Uh, and some of the most important topics were, uh, had to do, of course, or were spurred by the COVID-19 pandemic. They took a lot of time to discuss uh, the WHO's approach to health emergencies in the future. Um, 
but they also discuss things like uh, uh, the WHO budget and so things that have been ongoing discussions uh, at the, the World Health Assembly for years and which uh, have a direct impact on how, how the WHO is uh, going to work in the next uh, years and de decades. And I think, uh, you know, uh, the budget discussion, although a very uh, technical one uh, is quite relevant to keep track of because it shows, you know, that uh, although we have um, we have uh, seen some steps forward in the past months, so essentially uh, a working group on sustainable uh, sustainable financing of the WHO suggesting uh, that uh, there should be an increase of uh, the assessed contributions, which essentially make the WHO's flexible funds. They can use it for whatever program they think it's most important at that time. Um, those contributions were frozen for a very, very long time, which has meant that the WHO has had to turn to other donors, including corporate donors, in, including foundations such as the Gates Foundation. And of course, we know that you know this is not something that uh, doesn't leave a mark on how the organization works. Uh, the idea behind increasing this uh, this as uh, flexible funding was that uh, the, the WHO would have again more freedom to choose uh, which uh, which lines of its work once uh, it wants to develop more. Uh, but although this has come as a recommendation uh, months before, and although it, it had seemed clear that you know this is the direction that we wanted to take, apparently. Uh, there have been some pressures, uh, again, from the United States uh, that changed the discussion a bit. So uh, the, the proposed text that was uh, submitted to, uh, to member states in, uh, involved in the discussion, uh, again, turned, you know, the, the focus on how uh, still to attract voluntary contributions, which are essentially earmarked, which means that they are attributed to specific programs. And again, in the past, this has meant that, you know, uh, we have very important programs uh, aimed at strengthening health systems uh, in the long term, which are underfunded. They don't, don't even hit the target they, that, that the WHO sets for them. On the other hand, uh, we have topics that are perceived to be uh, it's very interesting for uh, for some donors, not only members, but also, uh, you know, non-members, uh, donors to the WHO, uh, which receive even more funding than they, than they can, can use. And this is essentially undermining how, how the, w, the, the, the WHO works. Um, so it's, you know, uh, it hasn't been assumed that uh, this year's health assembly would be the final uh, the, fi the final point where this uh, problem would be uh, resolved, uh, but essentially it's uh, it's been a bit bleaker uh, than uh, what has been expected. Thank you for that update, Anna, and thank you for your time. New Caledonia's pro-independence Kanak and Socialist National Liberation Front will be seeking the advice of the International Court of Justice over the contested 2021 referendum on independence from France. In December 2021, pro-independence groups and indigenous sections in New Caledonia, a special overseas collectivity of France in the southwest Pacific of near Australia, had denounced the outcome of the last referendum on independence from France. The 2021 referendum was marked by massive abstentions, with only 43.87% of the total electorate turning up to vote due to the boycott called by pro-independence groups in the region following the COVID-19 crisis. We continue the story of what happened next with Anish from People's Dispatch. Hi Anish, thanks for joining us. Uh, just for our audience, can you give us a quick recap of what has happened so far uh, regarding the referendum situation in New Caledonia? Yeah, I think uh, we need to take a quick recap on what happened in 2021. So that was the third and uh, supposed to be the third and final a uh, referendum uh, regarding independence and regarding whether or not people of New Caledonia wanted to be free from uh, France and a French rule. Uh, and that was uh, supposed to be held in, like, uh, in, in at least a more or less equal footing for all parties involved. Now, what happened in 2021 December is that uh, there was a COVID pandemic. We know about that. Uh, it killed about 280 people in uh, New Caledonia. And even though at the time the French government uh, and also the pro, sorry, the anti independence party were 
often called the loyalist, uh, claim that uh, since the number of deaths and the casualties have come down, uh, we can go ahead with the referendum. Now, that was something that uh, the Kanak dominated uh, anti, sorry, the pro independence party, I'm so sorry, uh, uh, are actually were against it. For one, it, uh, they were talking about the risks associated with, uh, you know, a referendum because it, in, it includes campaigning and campaigning at a time when a pandemic is raging uh, was something that they were all concerned about. But secondly, there was also the fact that uh, there were like communal mourning for those people who died. And since most of the people who died were Kanaks, uh, the Kanak uh, rituals uh, regarding mourning and like funeral uh, expected like had a, a sort of like communal uh, mourning that precluded them not involving themselves in any kind of political activity. So which meant that a large number of people would not be involved either in the campaigning or the voting part. Now this was something that was clearly brought to the brought to the consideration of the French government and the French government just did not consider any of it. Uh, this was something uh, when the boycott calls came in, there was in fact uh, a global uh, call for the French government to postpone the, uh, the matter uh, to a further date, maybe a couple of months later, uh, because not having uh, a group that consists of maybe, uh, like around two fifths of the population uh, is something that is quite going to be quite dangerous, politically speaking. And we are talking about a, con uh, a territory that has had violent struggles happening uh, for independence and especially ethnic, uh, you know, conflicts also uh, emerging at different points in time. Uh, that has also created a great deal of tension. And to diffuse tension, you really need something like a referendum where, you know, you can sort it out in the market democracy, but something of that sort was not afforded. And the fact that 57% of the people did not participate in the referendum. Uh, and obviously, the referendum came overwhelmingly in support of uh, the French, of French uh, rule continuing uh, and against independence, showed that like a large number of people who were for independence probably uh, kept themselves out. And this did not just include the Kanak. Uh, uh, indigenous uh, group but also probably other indigenous groups and maybe you know so, so several other racial and ethnic groups as well who were at that time probably at a point where they saw independence as a more viable future for the island right anish at the present the situation looks like that the settlers the pro independence independence groups the anti independence groups all of them and in fact the french government are all at odds with each other but the French government is quite determined to like go ahead with the, the integration process. What do we expect in the coming days? Yeah, so the integration process is something that is going to be quite difficult because a like the time is very short. Now we are talking about something that has to begin the transition. Uh, now what happens is that the transition that the new since the referendum results technically happens, uh, the new transition to becoming maybe a province, sort of a department within the French uh, Union, like the French Republic, uh, would require, uh, would have to happen uh, after June 30th. Now, before that, they need to have a referendum regarding the status of uh, the island within the French Republic, whether it needs to be autonomous, uh, with probably a separate constitution, or maybe just like, just another one of the other uh, provincial governments in the in the republic as a whole so that is something that they want to go ahead with and so time is pretty short uh, on the other hand the connects are refusing not just the connects but also like generally pro, uh, those who are for independence and against any kind of continuation of the french rule have uh, you know time and again called on the fact that they do not recognize the results of the last referendum, considering the fact that the majority of the population did not participate. Now, considering that, this is going to be a far more difficult process. And there are obvious, obviously fears that this could bring back the entire island, you know, uh, put them back decades behind uh, with regards to the kind of peace that has, uh, like a, especially ethnic uh, peace between different ethnic and racial groups. Uh, 
uh, in the island, and that sort of is my is under jeopardy right now because the more uh, the French government pushes for this, and without any uh, you know almost no consultation, there has been a couple of talks. But the French government higher ups are refusing to talk to any of the pro independence groups at this point. And so they just want to go ahead with the process of integrating the island into the republic. And that is going to be dangerous if the pro independence group, which kind of represent a majority at this point, uh, are kept completely kept out of the loop and they are not consulted. And that is going to create like further tensions that can, you know, devolve back into the sort of conflict that was very common during the 80s, very violent conflict we are talking about, and especially conflict between different racial and ethnic groups. And that can create like a sort of a war zone within uh, the Pacific Islands, and that is not going to be good for anybody involved. So it is, uh, we need to wait and see how the French government is going to uh, respond to calls of A, stopping the whole process of integration, and B, whether or not they're going to have any kind of uh, negotiations with the pro-independence groups regarding uh, the results of the, uh, the last referendum. And B, whether there is any inclination on the side of the more loyalist groups to engage in talks with, the, uh, with their you know, fellow countrymen, essentially, we're talking about. And these kind of things, uh, at this point, we do not see any hope at the point because the talks between different groups are quite different at this point. Like uh, the, the distance between them, the political distance is quite huge. And to surmount that is going to be far more difficult. And considering the time that we have, it's very, very small and very too little for anything remarkable to happen within the span of a month. Thank you for joining us for this story today, Anish. Thanks a lot. And that's all we have for today. For more such stories, keep watching peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.